Hello, I am Tim Field from Dalesford. It is Organic September and today I am joined by Henry Dimbleby. Henry, good morning. Thank you very much uh, for joining us. Uh, Henry, you are founder of Leon Restaurant. You uh, founded the Sustainable Restaurant Association. Um, I bumped into you over the school food plan which you founded. Um, you're a non-executive director of DEFRA. Goodness me, you are incredibly busy. Uh, but for the last couple of years, you have involved yourself with the National Food Strategy and written the National Food Strategy. What exactly is the National Food Strategy and what issues were you setting out to, um, to address? So the, the National Food Strategy was commissioned by DEFRA, but across government on the back of the Ag Bill and the Environment Bill. And it was a recognition that food is, there are elements of the food system that are the dominion of almost every department in government and the government needed uh, a single cross-departmental strategy to set out how we create a food system that not only delivers the extraordinary range of food at prices that would be unimaginable to previous generations but does so while restoring and enhancing the environment uh, that does so in a way that makes the country food secure and that stops making so many of us sick. So that in a, in a, in a nutshell is, is what the job is. And then I was going to, uh, at the beginning of this summer, set out a plan that, uh, a part one, which, which diagnosed the problems in the system, set out the power and the economics that created the outcomes, good and bad, and then COVID hit. And I decided to focus in part one on a direct response to COVID and recommendations regarding, urgent recommendations regarding our leaving the European Union at the end of the year. And so I've just published part one, which dealt with that. And then part two, which will be uh, in the new year, will be a much more uh, grand sweeping uh, systemic approach to resetting our system, which, um, uh, largely actually as a result of our fear of global starvation and our solution, our solving that problem has created these other problems of health and of uh, environmental degradation. Were there any particular areas that uh, you suddenly had to uh, find yourself rewriting or perhaps I don't know, the government caught up with um, what you were writing at the time as a result of the extraordinary events of 2020 and the pandemic? Well, I think that... Um, there are there are two things. One is uh, there were five hundred thousand people unemployed at the beginning of this year. That may be four and a bit million by November, and we face a real oncoming problem of food poverty. And there are uh, there's a suite of recommendations in that area. They've been taken up by Marcus Rashford, the England footballer, who's campaigning from them, and that is a really urgent problem to solve. The other uh, concern I have was actually the food system stood up very well. Everyone said it was going to fall apart. We were going to need rationing. And it was very robust to this crisis. But that was because of the nature of this crisis. This crisis was the shutting down of whole sections of the economy by government, which meant that they could mitigate that and allow food to continue to be grown and moved. But the next crisis is uh, almost uh, definitely going to be the climate crisis. And that is a very different set of problems. So uh, I'm, I, I think that this crisis w enables us to think about the unthinkable. But I worry sometimes that people think the food system's okay because we got through it and that isn't the case. So there'll be a big focus in the next uh, in the next um, report, the next in the final strategy on what I actually see as the same problem, the climate and biodiversity problem, which are two sides to, to one coin. And the food system is the mother of all sustainability uh, problems. It is, it is the single thing that has caused uh, most of these problems. Perhaps on to the solutions uh, a little bit. Uh, given it's organic September, what's your understanding of organic? And um, I applaud you for mentioning organic in the report, which is more than a lot of reports have done in the past, because we strongly believe that that nature-focused farming is part of the solution. What's your understanding of organic? And, and uh, well, it's interesting. what role does it play? Well, it's interesting, because 
or I think people are beginning to realize that organic is it is something much more fundamental than people who weren't involved in the movement maybe thought. So I think it went from originally, you know, you think of organic and you think of Silent Spring and you think of uh, a reaction to the way that farming was destroying nature. And then it became kind of through the 80s and late 90s, uh, much more linked to personal choice and person in, in the eyes of the kind of un, uneducated consumer. And uh, it was kind of seen as a middle class way of eating foods that were good for you. And I think that's kind of, there was that period when it stalled, really. Mm -hmm. And I think now, organic, uh, and, and maybe more broadly defined as an agroecological approach to farming, which isn't necessarily absolutely fitting into one definition of a particular organic regime, mm -hmm. is this recognition that the 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 way in which we did we created modern farming with large amounts of uh nitrogen artificial nitrogen fertilizer with high yielding crops and irrigation drove out uh a lot of the nature from our land and that nature wasn't only valuable in itself actually in the soil and in the systems that complexity was critical to the sustainability of the farming mechanism so it wasn't it was like, the, as I said, biodiversity, climate change, food system, they're all one thing. And I think that the other interesting thing that's, that's happened is that, that it was seen originally the kind of organic movement, although Silent Spring was, was actually pretty science-based, there was a lot of, um, there, there was a lot of kind of spiritual, uh, it, the, the early organic movement, a lot of it was built on a spiritual feeling and the science has caught up. So you've now got from the scientific side, people talking about the microbiome inside our gut, the biome in the soil. Uh, there's work that um, the, the, the government's uh, lead uh, marine center in Weymouth is doing uh, that, that they think actually that there's a pathobiome in water. So all the pathogens in water are there all the time. But when the biome changes, it causes some of those pathogens to uh, to exhibit themselves. And so you've got now this kind of joining together of complexity and the beauty of complexity. And for me, that is the essence of the spirit of the organic movement. And, and I'm very excited by this coming together of the two tribes mm -hmm. as well. And this idea that we, that this diet, this, it's not just a spiritual thing. You can, whether you're a spiritualist or a scientist, you can still, understand now that this is a movement whose time has has come excellent yeah i think that's uh, very nicely um explained how the movement is evolving um in in the science terms like the english organic forum put out a, a release following your um uh, part one piece of work and uh, said you know if we triple the amount of land uh, to around about 10 percent of english uh, agriculture um we would be fixing, or there would be two megatons less CO2 in the atmosphere, um, and a hundred million pounds worth of water treatment costs would be reduced, uh, and we'd get 25% more biodiversity. So uh, exactly that, some of these challenges that um, our economy and our climate and um, just producing food are facing, uh, organic seems to have uh, the science to back it up now. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, the, the the fresh water thing is really interesting. So, if you look at seventy five percent of fresh water pollution is caused by farming eutrophication, mm -hmm. and the WWF report that was published this Thursday, on the same day, in fact, as the Climate Change Assembly published their findings, uh, the the key the key group of species they're most worried about is, is fresh water biodiversity. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just another like reinforcement of this negative spiral that we need to break out of. Mm. And you mentioned it earlier, that sort of um, 1980s, 90s uh, perception of organic being um, a little bit uh, choice driven and, and uh, certainly associated with eliteness. Can we break that down to make it um, more available and accessible to all? Uh, you mentioned the big challenge in 
the fact that people just try to feed themselves. Well, I I hint in the in the last chapter. I I, I don't hint. I talk about one of my big concerns about the system, and this came uh, actually from talking to uh, one of the senior um, uh, senior uh, management in Acada, and they said that when they're trying to put on sustainable um, sustainable goods, they just can't compete with the stuff that is. Uh, currently, the way stuff is currently produced. And this is because the cost of that production is not built into the system. The negative externalities are not built into the system. Now, some people say, are you saying, that means that if you're going to build those into the system, are you saying the price of food is, got, is going to go up? I don't think that that is the case. The point of building negative externalities into the system is to focus human ingenuity in the right direction. So my belief is that if you got the definition of productivity right, so it wasn't just calories per hectare or calories per pound, mm -hmm. and it was looking at the, the, the real, you know, the amount of land used to produce food, greenhouse gases, etc. What you would see is not a um, an increase in food is you'd see another re another green revolution. You'd see people combining both the traditional organic techniques with uh, drone technology, building on min till technology, because suddenly, you know, in environmental degradation is not a long term solution to the problem of poverty. And you would what we have been doing is just creating that cheap food by using up natural resources and that's not a long term so i'm quite optimistic that you can get if you build in those negative externalities you will get further meeting of science and ancient wisdom the two things uh and and you will create a food system that is uh, that is just as productive but uses less land mm -hmm. and the land it does use uh grows not only food but has a, a much greater diversity of nature i'm an optimist on that front brilliant yeah yeah, I think there's still a, a, a place for the polluter pays principle as a bit of stick, but um, there are definitely uh, some brilliant academics in this country that can fly there. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think you will see, I mean, I'm where I kind of tend to I'll be, be honest about where sometimes with some organic people, I, um, I, I, they, they don't kind of see eye to eye with me as I think there will be a technological part of the solution will be technological. I do think you'll get I think vertical farms, as LED lighting comes down and as people work out how to uh, feed vegetables and fruit for the high things, I think you will get more vertical farms in cities. I think there will be kind of technological fix as well. And what you'll see is you'll see agroecological approaches combined with sustainable intensification, whatever you call it, combined with some land being freed up from fruit production. Uh, because you have both wild biodiversity and on-farm biodiversity. They're different forms of biodiversity. They're different yes. systems. And so I actually think you'll see a patchwork of that. And working out the, the, the key is how you work out the right sticks, as you say, sticks and, and incentives to make sure that you put the right, the right stuff happens in the right places. And one of the great contributors to uh, climate change, of course, is food waste. And... Uh, and I always argue that if we weren't wasting a third of the food, perhaps in our own fridges, because we, you know, were sucked into deals to buy more, or it's uh, rotting crops on the on the fields because um, contracts with uh, the big buyers are um, uh, are not favourable or, or um, haven't worked out, so cauliflowers rotting in the field. Um, it, are you addressing food waste in your uh, in your work? Yes, I am. I mean, I was actually, funny enough, I was very gloomy about food waste at the beginning, before the pandemic, in that I, my feeling was, although 30% of our food is wasted, the stuff that's wasted in businesses is a cost. And actually, you know, when you look at the detail of it, it's often wasted for quite, you can't work out how you overcome that reason. So, for example, tomatoes get, grow faster when it's sunny. And, but demand goes up when it's sunny. So if you have a sunny spell and then you get bad weather, you've got all these tomatoes, you can't find ways to deal with them. So there are often good reasons. And then in the home, I think people's behavior is hard to change. But actually, 
particularly that second part, as you said, the home is the, is the biggest issue because you've planted the stuff, you've looked after it, you've harvested it, you maybe have processed it and turned it into soup, you've driven it to a store, you've bought it in the store, you've driven it to your home, you put it in your fridge and refrigerated it, and then you've thrown it in the bin. You know, I mean, that is the worst form of waste. And actually, I am more optimistic that behaviors might change the food waste went down during the pandemic food became more precious mm. during the pandemic but just mm. not necessarily because you couldn't afford it because it was a pain in the ass to go to the supermarket or book a, a delivery and i think maybe you know i'm very nervous about saying is, is there good stuff it's been such a terrible terrible thing this pandemic but if mm. there was one thing there are some little little behavioral changes that i think we might be able to to keep and yeah. to, to build upon. What three actions can you lead on, do you think, that would help us to transition to uh, more organic production and consumption in the UK? Well, so um, uh, I'm working on it, so I don't know the answer yet, but I, the, 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 two big, uh, the two big areas at the moment that I'm working on where I think there is real uh, opportunity one is uh, this idea of externalities. So negative externalities. Not only do we not build them into the system, the government doesn't even measure them systematically. And it seems like a wonkish approach, but I really do believe that if you began to measure and report, as the government's committed to do, and the Das Gupta review will help, on the cost of the pollution of the water, the degradation of the soil, the pollution of the air, mm -hmm etc and report how you're building that into the system change the incentives so that you would push up the price of things that actually the true cost is higher you won't see necessarily the overall cost of food going up but you'll see a radical transformation of the food system because people like that car their senior manager will no longer be banging their head against the wall that the that the the, the eating our natural capital is being used to make food cheaper so i think that is the first thing. The other thing is, I think that our, the way in which we do research and innovation in the food system is fairly piecemeal and um, not particularly lined up. There's a lot of research that goes on into the genetics, but there are some really basic things such as farms systematically sharing their data. There's such a variety in productivity of in farms and productivity you know that means if you improve productivity you use less nitrogen you use less pesticide and i think there's a real opportunity to try and a bit like a duck much more like a dutch style get farm farmers in our country have been very bad at working together as cooperatives compared to europe getting farmers together finding ways in which they're comfortable to give their data finding ways in which we can link that to academics and business and then install a system of education and learning through the farm system and that is hard yards but they do it as i said better in other countries and i think we do it quite badly and so i think there's a combination of there of proper education a proper carrot and stick regulation on the system combined with learning and education and resourcing those things properly yeah yeah, we're, we're huge advocates of organic uh, research. Absolutely, we've been big supporters of the Organic Research Centre uh, as a foundation. Um, yeah. The true cost uh, accounting work is certainly very interesting. Of course, ELMS hopefully will lead to uh, a transition where we're um, rewarded for contributing public goods, which of course organic uh, has plenty of proven public goods. Um, and we are, we're part of Patrick Holden's Sustainable Food Trust um, pilot on uh, <clears throat> sustainability metrics on farms so hopefully yeah. I mean, if you haven't uh, tapped no, into no i that, think it's fascinating um, i think the work that patrick and uh, adele as well mm -hmm. are doing there is really impressive and actually in defra that they've been adele, i think the second is patrick's yes uh, the impact story goes on the second in defra a bit to help them work on it mm -hmm. and it is it's this idea of re redefining productivity we mustn't it's not about going back to a world where we are uh, producing six times less on a given bit of land than you know than we are now going back to it's not about going back to the early 19th century because 
with the number of people on the planet, that would be disastrous. You just mm -hmm. use, you have no land for wildlife left at all. But yeah. it is about thinking about productivity in a different way. Yeah. And that's that work that Patrick's doing is fantastic. Interestingly, Patrick's is one of the few, and I write about it in the report, the Sustainable Food Trust did a thing called the true cost of food. Yes. They tried to do that analysis. And they said um, it was food should cost twice what it does. And my my response to that in the report was, you know, is that an exaggeration? Is that lobbying? Is it about in the right ballpark? And the answer is the government has no way to answer that because no one other than uh, other than these individual organizations, lobbying organizations or membership bodies are doing it. So it's a really good example of how important it is. Because if it is twice the cost, then that is terrifying. But we need to know. What's your advice to our uh, followers and um, shoppers at Dalesford to uh, transition to a more sustainable um, way of eating and, and buying um, to conclude our chat? Well, I think that um, clearly they are already supporting people who are working in a, you know, farmers who are working using agroecological methods. So that is fantastic. I, mean, I was, it's, if you were to, it is an unbelievably complicated system with the health, the environment, the, um, uh, the food security. But if there was one thing we could all do, um, and it's very simple, is we could all eat more vegetables. Um, you know that is if you were to do if you were to force one thing to happen, and you know obviously you know, different forms of farming of meat have different impacts, but there is no doubt that if we all ate thirty percent more vegetables, we would all eat a little bit less meat, which of all sorts is slightly more uh, burdensome on the land, and we would be healthier and the environment would be better. So I think just working out ways of bringing that into our own diets uh, is important. Fantastic. Henry, thank you so much for your time and uh, enlightening us. And we look forward to seeing what comes out in part two, um, particularly at such an interesting transition with the, the agriculture bill and uh, trade bill and, of course, our response to COVID and uh, green recovery. Thank you for your time. Um, and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you. Not at all. It's an absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me.